Hey everybody, you got the wingman here and this is my virtual campfire where I do my level best to help you avoid making what could be some monumentally expensive yet avoidable mistakes. And not just about RVing either. I don't pretend, I don't pretend to have all the answers and I never will. But I do have an inquisitive as well as a skeptical mind and I enjoy listening to and learning from people who are super smart. And today you're going to hear from one of those people with some very good news about RVs and the law. Now, in particular, it's about franchise agreements. Yeah, franchise agreements. So this is a long time in coming, but evidently it's really good news for RVers. It's just a part of what RV Lemon Lawyer Ron Burge and I recently visited about. But before we get started, I'd like to know, have you ever had to hire a lawyer regarding your RV or... Do you know of anyone who's had a legal issue with their RV? And how did it turn out? Let me know in the comments below. So every time you and I visit Ron Burge, it's like, where do I begin? Because, you know, I, I hear complaints. I see things on, on uh, you know, comments on my videos from people that are frustrated and experiencing all these issues. Uh, is there anything going on currently, like at the beginning, you know, as we end springtime and get into summertime, that's affecting from a legal standpoint, RV ownership for people? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's been a real change starting to swell up now in the industry. There are three states now that have actually created an RV franchise law. And that law is going to really help both consumers. It'll help dealers in the industry, which is really what they were trying to do. But as a side benefit, the legislatures that have passed these three laws stuck in some real beneficial things for consumers to be able to use if they have to. And where are these? Uh, what states are these in? Yeah, uh, Maryland, Washington, and Wisconsin are the only three that have it so far. And the laws are pretty much identical in all three, which tells you that the industry and, and the dealers organizations were clearly working together to create this. And what is it? What what's the purpose of the law? What are they trying to do here? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. If you read the press releases for each one of these, they're almost exactly the same every single time. Uh, what they say they're trying to do is to update the industry. For years, what's happened is that RVs were in sort of a no man's land that just fell by happenstance into the laws that dealt with motor vehicles, even though a big chunk of them aren't motorized at all. So what the well, what they're trying to do at this point is essentially pull them out of the auto laws and create their own laws, both in franchising, legal responsibilities to each other, and also legal responsibilities to their customers. And that's the part that's really new. But but who's doing this? Is the or is the RV industry pushing for these laws, or uh, is there some consumer group doing? Because if it's the RV industry. I'm not trying to sound negative, but you can bet that they're trying to make things that that protect them, I would think. They are. And you can tell because in a lot of ways, the auto franchise laws, some of the basics of it are being reflected in the new RV franchise laws. Things like the sales territory that a dealership has. Things like the ownership of the dealership has to be disclosed and kept up to date so that if the dealership sells, the, the franchisor, the manufacturer, they know who they're really dealing with at the dealership. But most important, and, and obviously those are the things that the industry was trying to create in order to protect itself, to create some legal obligations between the two of them that really don't exist. But as a side benefit, when the idea got to the legislature, the legislature took what they were proposing and basically also stuck in some new things, some additional things, and made stronger consumer rights that didn't really exist in the law, so to speak, in the word of the law that governed franchises for RVs. What kinds of things? I mean, generally speaking, without getting too much into the weeds, what kinds of things are, are you know, protect us, the consumers out there? Well, first of all, you know, first of all, the RV manufacturer and the dealer have to be uh, recognized, certified, if you will, by the state as able to sell their product in that state. 
that creates some government records that a consumer then has the ability to look for and determine for sure the identity of who actually made the RV, no matter what brand name they may be using and what their real address is, no matter what their warranty or other documents might say. In other words, to better identify who you're really dealing with and who you really bought from. And there's some legal responsibilities between the manufacturer and the dealer that are now created in stone that are written down in this law. And there's also responsibilities that are now written into this law to the consumer purchasers of the RVs, which really is beneficial. For instance, one of the things is it governs how they can go about doing repairs in terms of the relationship with the customer now. Uh, also, a lot of times when parts are shipped from the factory to the dealer, the dealer will see not just an invoice perhaps for that part, uh, but sometimes there will also be a delivery charge or some other servicing fee charge, and those are now beginning to be looked at and in some of these states regulated. And that's important to consumers because you can bet literally nickels to dollars that the reality is that when they have to pay the factory more than what they were counting on, they're going to pass that cost on. So it protects the consumer a little bit more in knowing what's really happening, but particularly on warranty rights, legally speaking. The RV industry with these new laws is basically stepping into the same legal position that the auto industry has been in between the factories and those dealers for decades. Well, that sounds like a good thing. But but am I hearing that the dealers are going to be uh, maybe more responsible in lawsuits like We've talked before, and you say you, you generally you sue the manufacturer and not the dealer. Does that mean that when you do sue in the future, if it, this law kind of became nationwide, that you would be suing the dealer as well as the manufacturer? So you got them both in the in the lawsuit? Not quite. Uh, when we get ready to file a lawsuit, if we can't get things worked out, we have to sue somebody. Basically, we go by the fault rule. We look at the situation and whose fault is it. If it's the factory's fault, and most of the time it is, that's where we go. If the dealer has done something that is at fault, we will look at the idea of suing that dealer too where we need to. But these are all state laws. So it's not like there's a national approach going yet. Uh, and that, that probably will never come. I doubt if we'll ever see, for instance, an RV lemon law. Uh, there are several states where the RVs have fallen into the lemon laws that were created to cover cars and, and consumer trucks and that kind of jazz but a specific standalone RV lemon law, I doubt if we're, we're probably going to see that anytime soon. But this law that is being created, it gives rights and obligations. For instance, the PDI, the inspection of the vehicle, it gives the dealer the right to refuse to accept a bad RV. Now, that can be very beneficial to the consumer because when you get an RV that's bad, you can begin to wonder, did the dealer do what it was supposed to do? before deciding to sell that thing. Things like inspecting it, things like rejecting it if it wasn't right or whatever. But it, it's gonna give some extra ammunition, legally speaking, to consumers and to dealers. And at the same time, it does create some obligations to the factory by the dealers that are now written down and more enforceable. So it sounds like if you're gonna buy an RV in Washington, Wisconsin or Maryland, things are better for you now than they were earlier in the year and in years past from a consumer yeah, standpoint. Is, I think that is true. Uh, Wisconsin is uh, and New York are two states in particular to look at if you're thinking of buying a new RV because those two, two states I know, their lemon law that was intended to basically cover motor vehicles actually picks up some coverage for consumers beyond the normal chassis arguments. So are you confused? I'll tell you what, it's enough to make somebody dizzy trying to keep up with all the lemon laws in every state. Does it seem that way to you? I've said for a very long time that I think the RV industry needs franchise agreements, broad sweeping franchise agreements that are similar to the auto industry. But like Ron Bird just said, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. However, it does sound like the state legislatures in what was it? Wisconsin, Maryland, and Washington do have some new laws that seem to be moving in the right direction. By the way, if you don't know, the Burge Law Firm has been practicing law and focusing on lemon RVs for, I don't know, more than 30 years. And I think that no one stays up on the law and how it pertains to RVs more than Ron's firm does. Throughout the years, Ron has been a 
He's been a guest, sort of our go-to resource for all things pertaining to RVs and the law. And we have a link to a playlist of videos that he and I have done here on YouTube. His firm's web address is on the screen and a link to it and the page where you can go to if you think that you may have a Lemon RV and you can get a free evaluation from an actual Lemon lawyer is in the description down below. If you find these kinds of interviews helpful, I hope that you'll give it a thumbs up. Until next time, I'm Alan Warren. I'm the wingman reminding you, be safe, have fun, play nice, and don't leave your good manners at home. Thanks for watching.